Well, good afternoon and welcome to the continuing series of virtual forums for the Garden State Initiative. Really happy and thrilled to have everyone with us. And we have a really interesting program this afternoon. Um, leading our discussion this afternoon, I want to introduce one of Garden State Initiative's founding board members, Larry Mohn. He also led the Manhattan Institute and through a whole body of work that one part of which included um, Jason Riley and some of the work he did there as well as more broadly in, the, in this whole category. So this afternoon, we'll have Larry uh, spending time speaking with Jason and I'll turn it over to him. Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure uh, to be uh, interviewing Jason on this remarkable book, as many of you may know, in addition to being a current senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, he's also on the editorial board of the, of the Wall Street Journal and a regular uh, contributor as a, a columnist there. So he's a very prolific number of other books, uh, Please Stop Helping Us and False Black Power. But I must say that um, Jason has really outdone himself with this book. Uh, I think it's a remarkable uh, uh, treatment of a remarkable scholar, and you pulled it off beautifully. So, congratulations, Jason. I think I, you know, I, I think, and I know that this is going to be a great uh, uh, intellectual and commercial success for you. So, and, and a well-deserved one. So, I, I guess we'd start with what, what brought this the idea about doing this book. How, how did it come up that you decided uh, a history of Tom Sowell and his work was uh, important to get out there? Well, um, well, thank you uh, for that introduction, Larry. And I also want to thank the Garden State Initiative for their interest in, uh, in Tom's book and for all of you for taking out some time to, uh, to discuss his work. Um, uh, look, I, I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's tragic almost that um, names like uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates and Ibram Kendi and Nicole Hannah-Jones and Cornell West are better known than, than Thomas Sowell. Um, I think he's uh, someone who has uh, uh, written circles around them, frankly, maybe all of them put together, um, but not just in terms of the volume of his writings, but also the depth and the rigor of his thinking. This is a first-rate scholar, a first-rate intellectual, um, someone we'd be talking about who would deserve being discussed, even if he'd never written a single word about, say, affirmative action. Just his work on intellectual history alone is, is worthy of, um, of a biography. Um, so one of the reasons I wanted to write this book was to uh, bring him to the attention of more people um, and, and, and maybe uh, raise his profile among people who have already heard of him. Um, he didn't have a biographer. I was quite shocked to hear that. Um, I was not shocked to hear that he was not particularly interested in having one. <laughs> And one of, one of the reasons this book was so long in the making was that uh, a great deal of time and effort went into persuading Tom Sowell to um, uh, cooperate on a biography. He had told me to go off and write it on my own, that I didn't need his cooperation, and I could have, but I didn't want to. Um, I wanted him to sit for some long interviews, and he finally agreed uh, to do so, and, and that's how the, um, the book came about. That's great. Now, Tom, as you said, this is an intellectual history, and I think rightfully so. Anybody who's, you know, read deeply uh, uh, into Tom's work understands his dedication to ideas and the consequences of ideas. But I think it really is worthwhile to take us chronologically through that career, uh, because it really kind of gives you an indication of how powerful and impressive you know, this performance was over the course of five decades. So why don't we, do you tell us a little bit about his early life? Because it had sure. some rough edges to it. Sure, um, um, it's a unique story and it's, um, uh, it starts in, in, in 1930 in, um, in North Carolina, uh, outside of Charlotte where he was born. Uh, so this is the Jim Crow South, this is the depression. He's born into an extremely poor family. Um, he's orphaned as a toddler. He uh, never knew his father, who died before he was born, and his mother died in, in childbirth to a younger sibling, so he didn't know her either. He's taken in by a distant relative who, who first moves the family to Charlotte and then up north to Harlem when Tom's nine years old, and that's where he's raised. Um, very bright kid, uh, always. Uh, that was true. That was true from the start. It was recognized at the start, um, but he had a pretty tumultuous home life. Um, ended up dropping 
out of high school, never, never earned a high school degree, uh, leaves home at the age of 17, strikes out on his own, um, does a bunch of menial jobs, uh, and then gets drafted into the Marines during the uh, Korean War. And that's where he sort of starts to turn his, turn his life around, um, uh, is permitted uh, or, 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 or able to go to college on the GI Bill uh, after leaving the Marines and starts at Howard University, the historically black college in, uh, in Washington, DC, and then transfers to Harvard where he um, uh, earns his, uh, his undergraduate degree at the age of 28 years old. It's uh, quite remarkable how late how late a start he got. Didn't, all, didn't write- All, all, yeah, yes, all along, right. Yeah, didn't, didn't write his first book until he was 40. And then and, how many did you write after that? <laughs> no, depending on depending on how you count, um, he's he's published about fifty books. Fifty books. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fifty and, books. and and not the first one until he was already forty years old. Yeah. So um, so he 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 studies at Harvard. He uh, does graduate work, gets his master's in economics at at Columbia, and then moves over to the University of Chicago, uh, and earns his PhD under uh, George Stigler and Milton Friedman, um, and. Uh, and then really, you know, wanted to, to spend a, a career teaching. Tom wanted to be a college professor of economics. That's all he really wanted to do in his specialty, economic history, um, writing about the classical liberals, John Stuart Mill and David Ricardo and Adam Smith. That's his real the history expertise. of ideas. Yes, the history of ideas. His, his, big, his big idol was uh, Karl Marx. Uh, yes, Marx. early on, early yeah. on, he, um, he was a Marxist. Uh, even while studying at Chicago, Chicago right. under people like Friedman and Stigler, he remained a Marxist and didn't hide the fact. They knew it, he knew it, um, and, and, uh, uh, and yet those two, Stigler and, and Friedman, saw something special in Tom right. and really did nurture him, uh, uh, both in, 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 in his career uh, after leaving school uh, and even in, in, in addressing some of his material needs when he was in graduate school there in, in Chicago, they, uh, he, there was a time when he was going through some financial uh, difficulties and uh, was thinking of dropping out of graduate school and going to get a job. And they secured a grant for him to finish his studies and go on to become an economist. Uh, but after he graduates or after he earns his, uh, 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 you know, after he's, during the 1960s while he's working on his PhD, he's teaching. He, he spent his the 1960s and the 1970s in academia, teaching yeah. taught at, at Howard University, uh, where he had uh, first attended uh, college as an undergraduate. Um, he taught at Rutgers University, Douglas College there. Um, and then he went on to teach at Cornell. Now this 60s. was a very conscious decision on his part. I mean, he, as you said, he could have pursued the more theoretical scholarly work of his mentors. Uh, at, at, the, at the time, his first, his first love was classroom teaching. It wasn't even research. He wanted to right. be a, a, classroom, a classroom professor. Uh, and and what, what I think changed for him, Larry, was um, what was going on in academia in the 1960s. Um, this was a time when uh, you, know, you had an a anti-war movement, a women's rights movement, a black rights movement, um, a, a, a gay rights movement. And, and all of these movements found platforms on college campuses. And uh, higher education was in turmoil. They didn't really know how to deal with this new attitude of, of students. And Tom was sort of old school. He, he wanted to teach the way he had been taught. Yeah. And that was more and more difficult to do in the 1960s. So, you know, in Tom's case, it was, no, you cannot be excused from class to go to a protest. No, we are not gonna spend uh, the whole period discussing uh, the latest newspaper headlines. Uh, I'm here to teach economics, you're here to learn economics. No, I'm not gonna grade on the curve or lighten up on these kids and so forth. And um, that led to constant run-ins with faculty and administrators. And it all came to a head, I think, in the, in the late 1960s at Cornell with the right. student protest, right. the armed students taking over buildings. And, and Tom was really disgusted at how the administrators just capitulated to these students. And, um, and I think that um, uh, that, that was a, a, a defining moment in his teaching career. He stuck it out in teaching for another decade, uh, went on to teach at Amherst and Brandeis and then earned He's tenure cool. at UCLA. Yeah. And, um, but I, he, throughout most of the 70s, I think he had one foot out the door of yeah. academia. And then when he got the offer from the Hoover Institution at Stanford University in 1980 to be a scholar in residence there with no classroom teaching duties, no student hours and so forth, uh, he took it. And that's where he's, where he's been ever since. 
Right. Well, it's interesting about those those early years of teaching. You're absolutely right that the kind of radicalism at Cornell was something that he found quite revolting. But it was his initial experience at Howard, which was very interesting to me, because he basically thought that the students at Howard were getting away with murder yeah. and that there was a kind of low set of expectations about these kids that permeated the, the campus that really upset him. Is that, is that yes, that, that is that is absolutely right. And, and he was um, uh, uh, chided for his harsh grading right. at Howard because he thought the kids could do the work if they applied right. themselves. And many of his fellow faculty members wanted to go easy on these kids. They had lowered their expectation. And for Tom, you know, that, that experience was not unique to Howard. So we're talking about the, the early days of um, affirmative action programs in the 1960s, particularly the later 1960s. Uh, when he's at Cornell, this is when Cornell is just starting to bring in students, uh, some of which don't meet the standards of the average student on campus. Uh, Tom has long been a critic of, of affirmative action. But that criticism is based in part on personal experience with, um, with the kids he, he encountered while at some of these elite schools back in the 1960s and 70s and how they struggled because they were brought in for window dressing and were not prepared to do the work. Um, so part of, that, part of that is personal. And, that's, and, and, and Tom is unique in that. He, um, his personal experiences have long informed his scholarship. In, in any number of areas. And I can give you a couple examples of this. Um, one is his move away from Marxism. I mentioned that he was a Marxist <laughs> at, uh, throughout the 1960s, yeah. even while studying under Stigler and Friedman. And what Tom, and, and first I should explain why, you know, why, why Tom found Mac Marxism so attractive. Right. Um, so this goes back to him dropping out of, out of school, being on his own, uh, uh, working menial jobs in his late teens. So this is the 1940s living in New York City. He had a job as a messenger for Western Union. And uh, the office was located in Lower Manhattan down in the Wall Street District. Uh, but Tom lived up in Harlem. And so some, some days after work, he would uh, hop on a double-decker bus and just ride it home. And he would just notice how the neighborhoods changed. He'd, he'd go through the Wall Street District. He'd go up uh, Fifth Avenue past the shoppy, ritzy uh, shopping districts like Saks Fifth Avenue and so forth. And you know, he'd go past Carnegie Hall. He'd turn up Riverside Drive, another ritzy uh, residential neighborhood. And then he would cross this viaduct and there would be the tenements, the ghetto where he got off. And he would say to himself, you know, what just happened? <laughs> Why does it look like this up here? versus where I started on my trip home. And he said, Marx explained that. Marx, Marx had an explanation that made sense to me at the time yeah. uh, that I found very satisfying. And uh, so he was a self-taught Marxist. He had picked up a, 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 some secondhand encyclopedias and, and studied the entry on Marx. And, and, and that was his introduction to that type of thinking. And he was self-taught, but then he went to college and studied Marx. He did his undergraduate thesis on Marxism. That's a very good graduate book school. Marx, right? so, you know, yeah. he 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 knew his Marxism, and he clung to it um, through his twenties, even while studying under these you know free market uh, uh, demigods uh, of Milton Friedman <laughs> and, and 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 George Stigler. And what turned Tom ultimately away from Marxism was not um, book learning necessarily, or studying under Friedman or Stigler. It was a job in the government. In, in 1960, he got a job. Um, the Department of Labor, uh, where he was studying minimum wage laws and um, their effects on employment, particularly the employment of low-income groups. And he noticed a, a negative impact of these laws on the employment opportunities of low-income minorities. And it caused him to reevaluate, um, you know, not just his views of minimum wage laws, but his views of socialism, his views of government as this always and everywhere benevolent force in people's lives. So it was personal experience uh, as much as book learning Thanks. that turned uh, Tom yeah. away yeah. From, uh, from, from socialism and towards uh, free market capitalism. There's another interesting tale he tells and um, story that he tells in his memoir about working at the uh, US Public Health Service in Washington, DC at its headquarters back in the late 1950s when he was um, an, an undergraduate student. And um, uh, one day, a gentleman has a heart attack on the sidewalk outside of the building. And they bring him in and take him to the nurse's office. But then they determine that he's not a government employee. 
So he can't be treated in this facility and they call an ambulance that can take him somewhere where he can be treated. Uh, the man dies waiting for the ambulance to come. And Tom said to him, this sort of dramatized the nature of bureaucracies and their focus on procedures instead of uh, results. Outcomes, yeah. Um, yeah, outcomes. Uh, uh, as way, the way he put it was, a man died waiting for a doctor in a building full of doctors. Um, you, if you want to know, you know, why Tom is so hard on <laughs> bureaucrats and bureaucratic thinking, and, and right. it's not just book learning, ideologically, op, you know, opposed to the to this. But this this is a combination of things he's personally experienced and how that has informed his scholarship. And because he has had uh, a much more rich and varied experience yes. uh, than your typical academic or scholar, um, I think that makes his. Um, his scholarship all the more unique in many cases. Right, and, and as you said, it, it was about the fact that bureaucracies have their own incentives. Yes. If, if somebody had decided to help that guy get into the hospital, yeah. they were putting themselves at yeah. risk as well. Yeah, exactly. So you don't want to rock that boat. Yeah. So, uh, you know, his economic training, I think was, was seminal. I re you were just mentioning, you know, that they got him some money from a foundation to continue his work. And I think the letter from Friedman will say, well, you know, he's still a Marxist, but that's not going to last long. So yeah, that, that's, a, that's a funny story. So he, um, um, you know, there's a couple things that he got from, uh, from uh, Stigler and Friedman, I, I think that are worth, worth mentioning. They were his mentors, um, not only in terms of uh, him, him studying, you know, they were on his dissertation committee, but how they presented themselves as public intellectuals and how they taught. They were tough teachers. Um, they were sort of no-nonsense right. types, but they were not into indoctrinating their students, which is why Tom's Marxism uh, did not disturb them at all. That's not what they were about. Thomas said, uh, Milton Friedman told me, uh, never made any effort to convert me. And, 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 all, and all would often say anyone uh, that you can convert isn't worth trying to <laughs> convert. Um, um, uh, but but it's, it's, Tom also tells a story about how as a Marxist, um, he was teaching in the 1960s in schools. And um, yet there was no fear that he would bring his Marxism into the classroom to teach and he didn't. He tells a story about uh, finishing teaching one semester and the students came up to him and said, Professor Sol, we really enjoyed this course on Marx, but we still have no idea what you personally think of Karl Marx. Mm -hmm. And he said, that was the greatest compliment they could have paid me right. because that wasn't my job to teach them what I personally thought. But it tells you where we are today and, 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 yes. and, and how far we've come. But the other thing that, that Tom got out of um, Friedman in particular was um, the role of a public intellectual. And after Friedman left teaching, um, he, he went on and wrote a column for, for Newsweek magazine. He lectured widely in front of audiences that were full of non-experts and non-intellectuals and non-economists. And Tom really took that to heart. Um, he's written books for his academic peers, but most of Tom's oeuvre is not directed at fellow intellectuals. It is written in plain spoken prose for everyday people to understand. And I think he got a lot of that from Friedman. The role of a scholar is not simply to talk to your peers. It's to explain your discipline to people who are not steeped in this stuff. And that is, a, and that is something he took seriously in the books he's written, in the columns that he wrote. And when he retired his column in 2016, I, I said, uh, you know, a lot of people probably just lost uh, the best professor they've ever had, even if they never went to college. Right. Because those columns were, were content rich. I yes. mean, every every sentence conveyed a lot of uh, information and analysis. That yeah. was very, yeah. It was a rare talent. And I think he actually, as some people have said too, exceeded Friedman in his ability to do that. He had a natural touch for it. So he gets to Hoover and now it's like, this is paradise. No students, no uh, faculty, dining hall garbage. I can just kind of sit here and write and think. Um, and he starts to get into some of these civil rights issues. Can you talk about a couple of those books and some of the analysis that, that uh, went into that in terms of the, the, the issues of the time, such as- Sure, sure. Um, so th this, this speaks to um, what, I, what I said initially about why Tom is not better known today um, as some of those other names, uh, not as well known as some of the other names I mentioned. And um, 
to use today's jargon, uh, Soul got, got canceled a long time ago in many respects. Um, and it's when he began weighing in on racial controversies. Um, as we were discussing, his first discipline was intellectual history, and he largely focused on writing about that stuff in the 1960s. Uh, but beginning in the early 1970s, he started weighing in uh, on, on uh, uh, racial controversies, affirmative action, the direction of the civil rights movement, and so forth. And that is when he started getting into trouble, particularly with black intellectuals. Um, who uh, encouraged media types and, and, and so forth not to take Tom Sowell seriously, not to um, uh, turn to him for a perspective that was legitimate. And, um, uh, and that's really when it, when it started. Um, he published any number of books on, on affirmative action, uh, books on the, the role of human capital, what economists call human capital, attitudes, habits, behaviors, skills and how a group's development of these things is far more important uh, than how society at large is treating them. And, right. and, and if a group does, a minority or ethnic, uh, an ethnic or, or racial minority group does develop these, uh, this human capital, uh, they can overcome all kinds of, of, of hurdles that, that larger society might throw at them. Why, why don't you elaborate on that? Because there was a whole series of books that he wrote in the Hoover period on the differences he, and you can describe this to the audience too, the difference between culture and the immediate environment in which people are, are dealing with. Yeah, one, what one. What difference um, culture makes. Yes, yes, yes. So he wrote a trilogy, on a, a culture trilogy um, uh, called Race and Culture, Migrations and Culture, and Conquests and Culture. Um, and, uh, but before then, he had written several books, going back really to uh, a book called Race and Economics in 1975, and then um, a series of books on, 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 on affirmative action and preferential policies in the early 1980s, Ethnic America and so forth. And um, so he's been writing about the importance of culture uh, for, for a long, long time. And, and he's used several examples to illustrate his point. But if, one thing he's noticed is, um, or he's written about is uh, using the New York City example you had in the 19, you know, 30s and 40s and 50s, you had um, uh, the Lower East Side of Manhattan full of all these different ethnic groups, you know, your um, uh, Italian kids and your Irish kids and your Jewish kids, uh, they're, they're either uh, immigrants or first generation or second generation immigrants. And uh, there are people who would say, well, these kids are sitting next to each other in the same classroom, in the same building, in front of the same teacher, they're in the same environment, why aren't we getting the same outcomes in terms of uh, their grades or school attendance or what have you? And Tom would say, well, uh, yeah, if that is your measure of their environment and you're limiting it to that, um, uh, you should be shocked. But when you learn that, um, you know, that, that Russian kid comes from a culture where, or that Jewish kid comes from a culture where in Tsarist Russia, most of the society was illiterate, but most Jews had books in their homes and you realize the importance of learning that he's bringing with him to the classroom. And then you, he's sitting next to this kid from, uh, from Italy who when uh, they put in compulsory school attendance laws, schoolhouses were burned to the ground <laughs> because parents wanted their children working, not attending school. Uh, they had different priorities. So yeah, you know, technically these two kids are sitting next to each other and they're <laughs> in front of the same teacher. But if you take into account the cultural baggage they are bringing with them, and are going to take with them wherever they go, then no, they are not really uh, in the same environment. And we should not expect to see the same outcomes. And, and, and he's expanded this. You know, there, there, there are all kinds of examples of, of, of groups that have that human capital that have been able to overcome all kinds of barriers that the greater society is. All around the them. world. Yeah, he talks about the ethnic Chinese in Southeast right. Asia uh, outperforming uh, uh, the minority, the uh, majority population, both academically and economically, uh, to this day. Um, you, you say the same thing about uh, Japanese Americans. They come here, they endure lynchings, they endure internment camps, they endure not being able to own property in certain states and so forth. Today, Japanese uh, Americans uh, out earn um, uh, white Americans and outperform them academically and have for decades. So, so, so Seoul has, 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 has really taken on this argument that racism or discrimination is a blanket explanation for disparate outcomes. And, and that has really been fundamental 
to uh, to his writings on on race and culture. Right. Well, actually, you know, he also asserted that it, there is no evidence that anywhere in the world that uh, outcomes are proportional. To yes. The percentage of the population. Yeah, that, that, and that is a, a key. It, it sounds like a simple insight, but it really is key. If you look at someone like a contemporary, like someone today, like an Ibram Kendi or the critical race theorist, they're starting with the premise that soul rejects. Right. They're starting with the premise that uh, human capital is equally dispu uh, 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 distributed or randomly distributed among all groups. And therefore, we should see something approaching equal outcomes, but for something nefarious going on. Right. And Sol would say, no, you, you are holding up something that has never been seen anywhere in the world, anywhere in time as, an, as, as, as normal, right. <laughs> when in fact, disparate outcomes are the norm. And, and so he would, he, would, he would reject this, 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 uh, this premise out of hand. And, uh, but he's, he's been taking on these arguments, you know, Tom, Tom had anticipated a Kendi type argument uh, and, and refuted it before Kendi was even born. <laughs> well, the other thing it also uh, discounts is people's own individual preferences that, you know, if people are free agents, they will make choices that have to lead to different outcomes. Uh, yes. If you want to be a starving artist because you like being an artist, uh, that's going to show up on some of these other indices. And it doesn't mean you're being discriminated against. It's just that you've made life choices that are satisfying to you. But, uh, yes. Yeah, and, and, this, and this extends beyond discussions of race. This, uh, uh, you know, Sol has written on, um, you know, the gender gap in this regard. That's right. That um, when you do take into account um, uh, the jobs that some women want in lieu of, you know, because they want families, because they want children, they're steered into certain professions that will allow them to accommodate that. Um, when you take that into account when you're discussing the, the, the gender gap and make and make real apples to apples comparisons, it all but it all but disappears. All right. And he also, as you said, he just went global in these comparisons, not only about uh, people's cultures and preferences, but about the attempts to institute affirmative action programs all around the yeah. world and where they yeah. absolutely literally never worked. Yeah, he um, he's it's another area where he has been way, way ahead of the curve here. And, you know, he was an early supporter of the civil rights movement um, uh, in the early 1960s. Uh, you have to remember Tom's age, but he was in in college when the Brown decision was handed down. He was at Howard University in night school. And uh, as, as you know, described his thoughts at the time and wrote down his thoughts at the time, actually. And um, uh, it was supportive of, of, the, of the outcome. Uh, he, he has quibbled with some of the reasoning used by the justices to get where they got, but he has not quibbled with where they, where they wound up. Same is true with the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 and the civil rights movement in general in the 50s and 60s. Tom was a, a, a big supporter of these movements. It is uh, in the later 60s when, when, when the civil rights leadership moved away from equal outcomes and towards uh, special treatment for blacks, special preferences for blacks and so forth, as well as becoming, uh, taking on that more militant strain of separatism and anti-Semitism that Tom rejected uh, later on. That is when he started to, to part ways with the civil rights leadership. The other problem he saw coming was this uh, move away from development of, of human capital among Blacks that you had seen in the first half of the 20th century, and towards more of a focus on integrating political institutions, getting more Black people elected. The civil rights movement in the post-65, 66 era really turned its focus to electing more Black officials at the state and local level. And the thinking was that if we can just get more of our own in office, the rest of these disparities, whether they're academic or, 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 or economic, will take care of themselves. And Tom said, no, no, that is, that is not the way to go. Other groups have emphasized the human capital development first and worried about political clout right. later. And, and Blacks are, are, are going down a road that has proven time and time again to be the least efficient way to go. And he's been you know, shown to be true. Uh, or correct, I should say, on, 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 on many of these fronts. And affirmative action is a great example because now we are, you know, some half century into this uh, affirmative action era 
And uh, we have some natural experiments out there that have played out. You know, you had the University of California system uh, ending racial preferences in college admissions back in the mid 90s. And after it ended racial preferences, black college gra uh, graduation rates went up, including in the more difficult disciplines of, of, of math and engineering and science. And so a program that had been put in place to help increase the ranks of the black middle class uh, had in practice resulted in fewer black doctors and lawyers and architects and engineers than we would have had in the absence of the policy. And this is something Seoul predicted and saw coming 50 years ago. Right, well, part of it, you know, you mentioned his early economic training, you know, that never left him. Yes. And, and what they, you know, they basically taught him was that, you know, the first rule of economics is, is the rule of scarcity, that there's not enough to go around and you have to use economic mechanisms to sort that out. It's a trade-off. And the first rule of political practice is to ignore the first rule of economics, yes. Yes. which is to create a situation where everybody can get what they want, which yeah. they can't. So really only the politicians get what they want, which is yeah. real life. Yeah. Real life. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. And, and Tom, really, if you, if you really want to get inside of Tom's head and understand where he's coming from um, on pretty much anything he's writing about, the, sort of the intellectual framework in which he's operating, uh, the book to read is A Conflict of Visions, right. which is a book about um, political philosophy um, and human nature. And uh, th th these two conflicting visions Tom lays out in that book are the unconstrained view and the constrained view. Sometimes the unconstrained view is called the tragic view. And the, and the uh, uh, or sometimes the constrained view is called the tragic view and the unconstrained view is called the utopian view. And basically uh, what Tom is doing is trying to explain why um, so many of our uh, political disputes, uh, social disputes, uh, down through the centuries, really, he traces them back hundreds of years in this book, uh, results from conflicting views of, of, of human nature and how the world works. And so if you hold that, that more constrained view, you're someone who, who probably thinks there are limits to human betterment, that um, we may want to eliminate war or, or racism or crime, but it's probably not going to happen. So the best thing we can do is to put in place institutions and processes that help us deal with, manage problems that we're never gonna entirely solve. So you may wanna end war, you may want world peace, but it's probably not gonna happen. So you need a department of defense, you need a military defense. Right. You may wanna end crime, but that too uh, is probably not going to happen. So you need a court system to adjudicate disputes and so forth. And he contrasts that with that unconstrained or utopian view, which to use the term you just did, doesn't accept trade-offs, says no, there, there are no limits to human betterment. Um, it's just a matter of, of reason and willpower and, 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 and there are no trade-offs. And, and uh, we can not only manage these problems, we can eliminate them. We can, we can achieve social justice for everyone. And, and, social justice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and one of his books. Right? Yes, and um, and and so um, uh, if you want to understand where Tom is coming from and, and his uh, consideration of everything from from race and migration and culture to economics to uh, education to antitrust to this, that's the book to read. That's where he really lays out this framework of thinking. It's his favorite book. It, well, it's, it's, part, a brilliant, and, it's a brilliant book of political theory. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's part of a uh, trilogy, actually. Uh, the, 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 the next one was called The Vision of the Anointed, and then the third one was called The Quest for Cosmic Justice. And, and the, the, the latter two get into a, a critique of the visions themselves, the merits and demerits of them, and as a result are a little more polemical. But the first one, A Conflict of Visions, is really more about describing what the visions right. are yeah. and, and laying out that sort of intellectual framework. Well, he's a little cynical uh, in terms of the unconstrained vision because the intellectuals make the assumption that they are the people that can see this vision and that can lead us forward. Yeah, yeah, and, and that, uh, and that- and the People um, in the unconstrained vision are just getting in the way. Yeah, and that gets back to an earlier work where he laid that out uh, called, a book called Knowledge and Decisions, yeah. uh, which he wrote uh, before Conflict of Visions. And in, in 1980, he wrote Knowledge and Decisions, which is, a uh, 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 really a book about, um, um, I guess the best way to put it is that you want um, 
decisions to be made by the people who are closest to suffering the consequences of right. those decisions. And to the extent that uh, we separate those two entities, namely the people making the decisions and the people who will suffer the consequences, right. society is headed in, uh, in, in, the, in the wrong direction. And, and, and it's, it's a view uh, uh, that he, he builds on the work of Friedrich Hayek, who right. was um, um, not only someone he, he has studied, but actually studied under at right, the at University Chicago. of Chicago, right. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a book that builds on Hayek's work um, and was actually reviewed by Hayek and very well, well received uh, uh, by him. But that is, Sol, Sol talks about how we, how we need to, to really view intellectuals as, as just another special interest group right. that has its own agenda. And, and, and this idea that we should simply defer to the experts and not view them skeptically is, is the, wrong, the wrong approach today. And, 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 and he sort of makes the case for that in Knowledge and Decisions. He also attaches it to what you uh, alluded to earlier to the um, hostility uh, or alleged hostility of many blacks to Tom's views because they feel that he's being disloyal to the, you know, the, the black race in terms of moving it forward. But mm -hmm. Tom's very adamant that what you're really talking about is black intellectuals, not your average yes. black person. Yeah, he's, he's made that, um, that point time and again in interviews when, when the person has said, you know, how does it feel to, to, <laughs> to, to run against the grain, to go against the grain of, of, of so many other black people? And Tom says, no, 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 you mean I run against the grain of, of black intellectuals and black elites, but they're no more representative of blacks than white intellectuals and white elites are of most whites. And, and that's been true for a very, very long time, Larry. I mean, you can go back to the, to the busing debates of the 1970s where you had um, uh, the NAACP types wanting kids put on these buses and shipped out two hours a day in one direction to uh, integrate white, white schools. Um, whereas black parents, most black people uh, never wanted, were in favor of busing. They wanted the good schools built right there in the neighborhood. It continues today with, with discussions of school choice. You know, right. Charters and vouchers are extremely popular among most blacks, and particularly among most black parents. They are opposed by black elites. Uh, voter ID laws are supported by most blacks, opposed by most black elites. This whole defunding the police movement coming out of the Black Lives Matter activists today is something that black elites support, but upwards of 80% of blacks polled say they do not support. So, so this disconnect that, that Tom has been calling out for some time, I think has only gotten gotten wider. And, and, and yes, it's, it's another reason why um, you know, the, 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 the left, you know, c controls uh, the media that has, that has allowed these, these narratives to go forward by and large. It controls academia. Um, it controls uh, the, the, the circles that, that hand out the awards and the academic prizes. And Tom, and Tom has simply refused to play footsie with these right. individuals over the decades. And it has cost them. He has paid a price right. in terms of prestige and in terms of notoriety, uh, because I, you know, I've argued that Tom is more interested in, in, in telling the truth than in being popular. And it's sort of distinguished him as an academic. He's, he's an empiricist. He, he follows the facts where they lead, even when they lead to unpopular conclusions or politically incorrect conclusions. Or and, conclusions that yeah. people are afraid of. You know, you In mentioned, some the, cases. Whole, you mentioned yes. the whole IQ controversy. Yes, oh. yes. It, it, even, even then. Um, and, and what's interesting about the, the IQ controversy um, is um, you would think that the Black elites would be very appreciative of Sol's work in this area. Um, yet at the time, in the, in, the, in the 1970s, when he started looking into this, he was discouraged by black intellectuals. Tom, Tom had started looking into this to respond to a scholar named Arthur Jensen, who um, had written about um, differences in academic outcomes being genetically based, differences in intelligence being genetically based. And Jensen had said, therefore programs like Head Start that are supposed to close, help close these learning gaps, they're gonna be essentially useless because all of this is in the genes. And, and Sol said, you know, I, I think Jensen's wrong, but 
I got to find out. We got to we got to gather the data. We've got to do the research. We've got to find out uh, if he's right or wrong. And we shouldn't be afraid of what we might find. And he started collecting IQ scores and so forth, doing his own personal research. At one point, collecting more than seventy thousand IQ scores to test Jensen's theories. Others just wanted to call Jensen names and be done with it. And 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 then there were these black intellectuals who approached Tom and said. You know, stop doing this. You are only going to legitimize what this guy is saying and what people who, who support him are saying. And Tom said, you know, what are you afraid of here? You know, <laughs> if you want to help people and I want to help disadvantaged Blacks, we need to know where they are. Right. We can only help them get where they want to go from where they are. <laughs> and, 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 and not, not testing them or pretending that there's no gap will not eliminate the gap. It will only obscure the game. And this is a debate that continues today with the SAT test and these this efforts in, in academia to get rid of it because of the disparate outcomes. Um, getting rid of the SAT test will not eliminate the gap that shows up in scores. That gap will just show up somewhere else later on down the line. Uh, you, you, you can't paper it over. You have to deal with it. And so Sol looked into this and, 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 and he found many things that undermined uh, Jensen's That's thesis, insane. and he presented his findings. And so 20 years later, when Charles Murray comes along with the bell curve and, um, and, 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 and takes up Jensen's cause, essentially, uh, Tom, Tom pounced on that as well and took on those arguments the same way that he had taken on Jensen's. And to me, it tells you about Tom's independence, his adherence to truth, even if he's ruffling the feathers of people he largely agrees with other otherwise on many, many other issues. He's spoken very highly of, say, Murray's work on welfare reform, but he has refuted uh, strenuously Murray's work on race and intelligence. Yeah, I think that's the quality, you know, you mentioned he doesn't mind not being popular, but his courage in terms of going for the truth no matter what we yeah. find, because that's yeah. the only way yeah. to move forward is to know yeah. where you are. Yes. Really yes. Yes. So, so now he's 90 years old and, um, you know, he stopped writing the regular columns and, you know, maybe there'll be a book or two. Uh, he just actually just put out a great book on charter schools. You yes, know, he did. Doing he the, did. the latest research. And you're a little discouraged because you don't see that many Tom Sowell's out there. Do you want to kind of talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, I, I think when, um, when you're, Cornell West uh, uh, leave the scene, there's going to be a whole army of younger Black academics um, uh, saying the same things coming up right behind him. Um, I don't know that the same thing can be said about Thomas Sowell. And that is what I find, I find discouraging. Um, I think there are more today than there were 30, 40, 50 years ago. Sol wrote a letter to his friend uh, Walter Williams back in the mid 2000s about how um, uh, there are a lot of younger blacks today he noticed that uh, were saying a lot of the things that he and Walter had been saying for, for decades and that he was encouraged by this. Um, but this was the mid 2000s. This yeah. predates the Black Lives Matter movement, the sort of ascendance of, 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 of progressivism and now critical race theory and so forth, stuff that is really in our elementary schools now. Um, uh, so I don't know if Tom would be as optimistic, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not particularly optimistic right now. Um, you know, one of the criticisms uh, that I got about Tom when I interviewed people, um, and these are from people who admire him, um, but the one critique they had was uh, a few of them said, I wish Tom had stuck it out in academia that um, um, if he had stayed in teaching, true, we wouldn't have all the books and all the columns and so forth, but we might have hundreds if not thousands of students, graduate students who had studied under, under, under Thomas Sowell, who had earned their PhDs and uh, had him supervising their dissertations and so forth. And they would be out there today and they would be the next generation of people out there to continue uh, that type of work in the way that the left has and, and all these uh, young leftists out there. And, um, you know, I, I don't know personally if I would trade all the books and the columns for anything, but I think there is something to that, to that uh, criticism. 
Yeah. Well, in an ideal world, but I think, you know, we talked about his experiences in teaching yeah. and yeah. also the kind of extraordinary mentorship that he got from people like Stigler and Friedman. To them, that came naturally. To him, temperamentally, yeah. that was very difficult to do. He, he, you're, you're, you're right. Um, soul does not play well with others. And I don't know if he had the temperament. You know what's funny is he, uh, in his own memoir, he, uh, he talks about uh, working at school after school, resigning from school after school after run-ins with the faculty and, and administrators and so forth. And even in his telling of what happened, you're scratching your head and you're going, Tom, you quit over that? I mean, <laughs> really? <laughs> Couldn't you bend a little bit? And of course, this is his version of events. <laughs> right, that's right. Oh, yeah. it does it does make me think he's just someone who was always going to have some trouble with the faculty lounge and if you want to stay and one way to illustrate this Larry is um and I get into this in my biography that uh, in the in the early in the mid 1980s and early 90s there were any number of of, of younger black thinkers they weren't Tom Soul but they were criticizing the black civil rights old guard and their methods and their approach to helping the black underclass. Um, I mentioned names, you know, Randall Kennedy and Stephen Carter, Glenn Lowry was in this group. Um, um, William Julius Wilson was even mentioned in this. Again, they were not what we call a conservative. They were self-identified Democrats, really. They, they were, and, 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 but they were unorthodox thinkers. Right. And I thought for a moment, Seoul might have some company. Uh, yet for various reasons, and all of the reasons differ from one to another, um, they, they either, you know, had second thoughts about what they were saying, um, or had said their piece and now wanted to talk about something else, but they didn't really stay the course the way Thomas Sowell did. And as I thought more about it, one thing that occurred to me that they all had in, co in, in common by and large is that they were academics, and they wanted to remain academics. And it is hard to, to, to say the things and write the things that Thomas Sowell has done and stay in good standing uh, among your fellow academics that you're working with day in and day out, dealing with department heads, dealing with, the, with administrators and so forth. Those folks wanted a life in academia. And, 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 and that might have had something to do with why they didn't continue saying some of the things that they were saying before. Uh, I'm reluctant to put people on the couch. I, I think that happens far too often, particularly to black conservatives. So I'm reluctant to do that. But I do look at the, the sort of intolerance on campus today. Um, it didn't start yesterday. It started a little while back. It started decades ago. It sort of reached a crescendo today in terms of how intolerant uh, opposing views are uh, on college campuses. But, but that, that might have been the beginning of it. Or, or, yes. or close to the beginning of it, Tom said, to hell with it. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. going to go off and write my books and columns. Others decided to stick it out. And th the price they had to pay was to just sort of zip it up on some of their views and, 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 and play nice, go along to get along. Well, look, I always like to give people suggestions so they don't get discouraged and give up. But, you know, mentioned in the book, so many young people are attracted to Tom for yeah. all of the qualities that we described. First, his brilliance, his courage, his directness, his honesty, et cetera. So we've had this phenomena of Jordan Peterson, right? On his podcast. So I suggest your next uh, business deal with Tom would be for the two of you to start a Tom Soul podcast and make a million dollars. And uh, I, think, I think you'll find that it'll be a productive way for him just to hang out at Stanford and maybe, maybe, make some money, maybe. right? And uh, get more young people interested in these things. Uh, that's about all I wanted to explore. Do we have any questions uh, for Jason at all? So those on the call, um, this is Regina, um, can either unmute if you'd like to ask it live or use the chat session. Um, and in the interim, if um, she, uh, you may be getting some, looks like, <laughs> handed to you, Larry. Yeah. Um, you know, Jason, uh, you know, you were just talking about other people, you know, picking up the, the mantle and some of the, you know, um, paucity, I guess, of, uh, of those that you see. I guess one of 
you know, the areas that we look for is anywhere in New Jersey that you see, I know, you know, you live near here, but um, anywhere in New Jersey, you see someone who could, you know, help be a leader intellectually, not necessarily in all the issues, obviously, that Tom uh, covered, but anyone that uh, you could help point out, that would be very helpful. Okay, <laughs> we'll keep that in mind. I will certainly keep that in mind. Okay. Thanks. Right. Well, I think, you know, the, the advice in terms of New Jersey is that Tom says, you know, politics is really kind of not the ideal way to move it forward. It's really about ideas and understanding trade-offs. And I think, you know, to the extent that we can inform conversation more in New Jersey along those lines, yeah. it'll well, be better I, off. Well, I am optimistic that um, that Soul's writings will will endure. Um, he, he's, he's, he's written so much and um, covered so many areas. And I think in hindsight, it's been correct about so many things that his ideas will have to be grappled with. They will not be able to be ignored. Uh, they're gonna be out there. Um, um, people will have to engage. So, and, and the other thing that he has going for him is again that um, the clarity of his writing, the accessibility. I think what really, really distinguishes Tom is how accessible he is in his scholarship. Uh, and, and, and I've read it, I'm sure all of you have read enough academics who can't write, <laughs> they're so inaccessible. Sometimes they're brilliant, but uh, in terms of expressing themselves in ways that the general uh, reader uh, can understand, readily understand, that's a skill, that's a separate skill. And Tom has it in spades. And, and, and that I think will help uh, uh, in terms of his influence over future future generations, he's he's just someone that, that people will pick up, uh, and and I think really caught into some of these ideas and, and carry them forward. So I, I think his 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 body of work will 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 endure, and and help him in, in that respect. I, I will also say one other thing. I in conjunction with the with the book, I narrated a documentary film. Um, about Thomas Sowell for public television uh, called uh, Thomas Sowell, uh, Common Sense uh, in a Senseless World. And um, you could view it on, on some of the streaming sites, Amazon and YouTube. And what the producers told me is that they could track some of the uh, demographics of who was, who was watching the film. And I was very encouraged by the fact that they skewed younger. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people in their 30s, 40s, uh, the, uh, the person who runs an internet show out at Hoover, Peter Robinson, who's interviewed Tom a number of times, says that whenever Tom is on the show, um, young people go crazy. They love him. Uh, the younger, the better. So um, that, that too gives me, gives me um, it's encouraging. It's encouraging to hear stories like that. I have another question here. Tom Sowell is often labeled a conservative, but he is not particularly fond of labels. How did he feel about the title of Maverick? I did not ask. <laughs> I, I, my, my, uh, I said, um, I said, I prefer to ask for forgiveness than permission. That yes. was the, the mindset I brought, I brought to it. Um, um, he, he, Tom is a, mo he, he's a very learned person. He's very, intellectually intimidating um, if you uh, uh, have, have read him but not met him. If you've met him though, you know he's a very gregarious and uh, 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 funny, self-deprecating uh, person. But um, in, in his academic work, he does not suffer fools. And, and I think that, um, you know, t we'd be talking about Tom, like I said, if he'd never written, weighed in on these controversies at all, just because of his work on social theory and his work on political philosophy uh, and his work on economic history. Um, and, and when he stuck to those lanes, he stood out. Tom was an all-star academic and in many of these schools where he worked in the economics departments, and we're talking about some of the top schools in the country, uh, he had published as much, if not more, than all of his colleagues in these fields. Tom could have had tenure at any top flight school in America and spent his days teaching there if he had chosen to do so. Uh, he, he has written about how he turned to writing about these racial controversies really out of a sense of duty 
that there were things that needed to be said and there were too few other people willing to say them. And to me, that that's that's a maverick. That's uh, <laughs> and and you know, I think we need a hundred more just like them. Getting just back briefly to that first question uh, in terms of topics in New Jersey, I think you know that last book that he did on charter schools is something he feels very strongly about. So yes. if there are speaking opportunities, well, oh, that's gonna be, he does not fly. someday you'll explain that one to me. Even with a private jet, he will not fly. But. Uh, but on charter schools, he will speak out very strongly about this as a way to, you know, to get blacks to move up in the world, to get the kind of yes, and and, and education has right. been something he's 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 written about extensively over the decades. I, I, you know, if if that book turns out to be his final book, it will be a suitable swan song to a right. publishing career that has now right. spanned sixty years. Anyway. His um his first book was an economics textbook for college undergraduates. Um, full of charts and graphs and jargon and so forth. Uh, uh, and then he wrote a book about economic history. Um, and then he wrote a book about black education, uh, came out in 1972, I believe. Uh, so he's been writing about this for, for some time and has done pioneering research on um, the history of, of, of black schools in America that have excelled both uh, grade schools and high schools. It's an issue he cares uh, deeply about. And so I think his, his writing on charter schools in that book is really um, a, a continuation of, of decades old work that he's work, done right. in, the, in the realm of education. Yeah, that's great. Well, Jason, again, uh, congratulations. It's, it's, it's a book to be very proud of. Thank you, thank you. And good luck with your tour, so to speak. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay. thank you, Larry. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jason, very much. And uh, thanks for everyone for joining us today. Larry, thank you for covering a lot of subjects. Jason, of course, so for all of your insights and the scope you were able to cover with us this afternoon. Really enjoyed the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your interest in the book. Great. Okay. Thank you. Great. That will end the